Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that we find you all safe and well. This is your first time joining us for Fridays with Freelander. We've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons, researchers, and current and former trainees. If you missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please visit the dedicated Fridays with Freelander page on our department website at www.neurosurgery.pit.edu. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question into the Q&A chat box, and we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. If you have any questions after today's event, or if you're watching the recorded version and have questions or comments, please email me at jrm233 at pit.edu. This week, we're highlighting one of our extraordinary and very accomplished neurosurgery researchers, Dr. Marco Capogrosso. As for that, Dr. Freelander, thank you, and please take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Justin. And it's really, truly a, a pleasure and a delight uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Capogrosso, who's become a friend and obviously an esteemed uh, uh, colleague uh, uh, to myself and, uh, and to the department. The work that he is doing is uh, it's truly amazing and, and very, very different than, than anything else that I've seen uh, 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 before. And as you will see from his presentation, he has been able to apply techniques of uh, spinal cord stimulation to um, essentially reanimate limbs that uh, that are that are not working for a variety of reasons. And you can uh, imagine that the applications of this technology are uh, immense for many different kinds of uh, pathologies that he has and continues uh, uh, to work on. Uh, this is one of the um, great examples of what our department is doing and how we believe or we're in the leading and cutting edge of a uh, neuroscience and translational neuroscience as a department uh, you know there, there are clinicians there's the uh, the neurosurgeons uh, that uh, obviously we do we do the the surgery evaluate the patients and and uh, you know do uh, amazing procedures that our faculty does on a broad variety of patients that come uh, obviously from our western Pennsylvania region, but really nationally and internationally. Often we're a point of last uh, resort uh, because of the complexity of, of, of their problems. Now in the chronic phase after patients have either injury for uh, whatever number of uh, reasons, could be trauma, could be a, a stroke, uh, could be a tumor, could be many reasons, then there are neurological deficits. And uh, you know we're committed as a department uh, to see the patients from A through Z and to treat them at all different uh, stages. The, the, there's the acute state where the problem occurs and some occur either very fast or as a, as a process of a chronic uh, neurodegeneration. And, but there's the chronic phase after all this where you know, the arm's not working, the leg's not working. And we, we used to say traditionally, well, this is all that, that we can do, but uh, the technology that uh, Dr. Capogrosso is really a world uh, leader uh, in is, uh, is making a difference. And he will show you today some uh, really the, the fantastic uh, work that he's involved with. So uh, Marco, thank you very much for joining us and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Robert. I, you're too kind and I really wanted to publicly thank and acknowledge the contribution of Dr. Philander who is a big motor behind this research and he really pushes me always towards the next challenge. So uh, today um, I wanted to discuss with you um, a little bit the status of research of spinal cord stimulation for the recovery of motor control and particularly what we've been doing in the last two years here in the Department of Neurological Surgery at Pitt. So, I mean, the questions that we have and, and, and basically uh, uh, and Dr. Freelander introduced is whether we can fix paralysis. Normally, uh, like he said, in the chronic state, um, patients are left to some uh, remaining deficits, which could be very tiring depending on their disease or mild paralysis, but still impairing or their quality of life. Uh, but things are starting to, to change in the last years because of the, uh, let's say, um, different application of an already existing technology that is called epidural spinal cord stimulation. 
This is a neurotechnology that is actually pretty old. The first applications were um, put out in the 70s or in the 80s, so it's been on the market since already quite some time. But the main focus of this <laughs> medical therapy is to deliver electrical stimulation to the sensory afferents to uh, treat um, uh, refractory pain. So which is that sort of pain syndrome that doesn't um, um, respond to normal pharmacological treatment. Uh, it is an FDA approved technology. It is safe and, and effective to treat pain and it can be implanted either through quite complex neurosurgical procedures or even percutaneously in a day um, outpatient procedure. Uh, in the US, uh, we're talking of about 15,000, 50,000 implants per year. So there's a large application of this tool. Um, why this is important? It's important because it's a basic, basically a technology for which there's a lot of expertise around. Uh, neurosurgeons uh, know uh, how to implant this system and the entire system of care is already deployed to take care of these patients. Uh, but the cool thing is that incidentally at the beginning and then with some clinical trials, uh, people have had the opportunity to uh, test this, this technology for a different application because they found that people that had paralysis and were uh, implanted for pain reason were actually improving their, their motor control. So those initial observations evolved into clinical trials like this one that I participated uh, in, uh, led by um, Professor Gregoire Curtin in, in um, Switzerland, and similar clinical trials in the United States that are undergoing right now in Louisville, in Kentucky, and at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, they showed that people with spinal cord injury, like uh, this person we see here in the picture, uh, when they uh, had a spinal cord stimulation implant in the lumbosacral region in conjunction with physical training, they would be able to recover locomotion uh, and even stand up uh, from the wheelchair. And most specifically, uh, we could observe uh, two uh, types of uh, effects. Uh, what we call immediate effect, meaning that as soon as the stimulation is turned on, these people even with complete paralysis seem to be able to control better their limb. And another type of benefit, which is very important, is the long term effect. Once these people have been um, trained to use this system for longer period of times, they get better and better at movement and finally can even step out of, uh, of the wheelchair and, and take steps uh, over ground. So, uh, we summarized a bit of these results uh, so far um, uh, in the literature that has been published uh, in the different types of spinal cord injury because I wanted to show you uh, what we uh, what, what we got so far in spinal cord injury. Um, so Asia, A, 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 I, S, A, B and C, D are the classification of severity of spinal cord injury. Uh, when one is, is classified A, it means that it's a, a motor complete injury and sensory complete. There is no movement and no sensation. In B, there is no movement, but there is some sensation. And in C or D, there is some movement and some sensations. So um, in terms of immediate effect, when spinal cord stimulation is active, uh, so all the time it has to be active, actually uh, virtually all patients uh, were able to activate voluntary paralyzed muscle, even move joint, um, stand and even walk on a treadmill. But when we start getting to more complicated uh, um, tasks like walking over ground, we can start seeing a stratification of people for which the less impaired really could walk over ground and only as about a third of the patients uh, very severe could um, recover over ground locomotion. But something that was really interesting for us was the fact that um, there were some effects that lasted even without stimulation. So after uh, many months of uh, training with the stimulation, we observed that the patients that had incomplete injuries uh, were actually able to move, uh, stand or even walk over ground, some of them, even without the use of stimulation. So it is as if um, the application of this technology over a long period of time and in conjunction with physical training is improving uh, uh, their capacity to control their body regardless of whether the stimulation is present or not. I want to still be clear that of course the motor performances of any of these subjects when the stimulation is still present are much better. So we, we are looking at the device that gets implanted and people permanently have forever in their bodies. But um, we can see that in fact uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a timeline for which people 
is, is not uh, they can in continuously improve and we don't know yet what the plateau is because the studies um, are st is still too early uh, to reach <coughs> a plateau that is ob observable and described because this is essentially happening uh, now the last publication was in 2022 so while this was happening, um, uh, what I wondered was what about arm movements? Because all this research has been really focused on locomotion, uh, which if you want is the main, um, probably the first thing that comes to mind when we think of paralysis. But actually arm movements and, and arm paralysis is uh, probably way more common than leg paralysis. This is because there is not only spinal cord injury or traumatic brain injury, but also stroke, for example, that causes uh, uh, severe um, deficits of the arm and hand. Uh, but this technology was developed uh, uh, for locomotion uh, only. So we started looking uh, into this into this problem when I moved here at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, I mean, um, essentially, if we look at the numbers, for example, for stroke, uh, they are enormous. It is, in fact, the first cause of paralysis in the United States today. Uh, there are 800,000 new patients per year that suffer a stroke, and at least half of them suffer from permanent motor deficit of the arm and hand. Uh, this is really impairing because there is no effective clinical therapies in the sense that the state of the art, which is re rehabilitation and occupational therapy, leads to recovery, but eventually uh, this recovery plateaus to an insufficient degree for at least 400,000 people a year. And um, of course, that we quantify this in money spent uh, for this disease in $46 billion in the year 2014-15. What does that mean, really? That number doesn't mean anything on its own, but it does mean that uh, this is not just the cost of care, it's the cost of the fact that people, because of the impairments in their hands, can't actually go back to work, they have other side effects, um, uh, uh, de depression and also uh, uh, reduction of income because of absence of work and uh, uh, assistance every day needed also for their primary caretakers, which often are family members. Uh, so we really need an approach that is similar to the one that has been developed for locomotion to target the upper limb to really bring down these enormous uh, uh, numbers. Uh, so stroke specifically, um, at least the types that cause permanent paralysis, essentially um, uh, damages a connection between the motor cortex where our neurons that control the body are located and the spinal cord where actually movements are implemented by cells in the gray matter. Uh, so if you want, it could be considered some sort of equivalent of a cerebral spinal cord injury. So these neurons are disconnected from this area where they control the hand. And so in a way it is very similar and I thought maybe if we were to tailor this technology for the uh, part of the spinal cord that control upper limb movement, we could obtain uh, similar results. But obviously the mechanism of this deficit are pretty specific, like arm, arm paralysis normally uh, is expressed through a series of very um, identifiable uh, problems. There's, uh, the most identifiable is loss of strength, so the inability to activate muscle that causes flaccid paralysis, but we also have loss of dexterity, even when there is some muscle activity, it is impossible for patients to control their fingers or to produce great uh, arm and hand forces that are required to manipulate objects. And uh, finally, there's a, a very peculiar phenomenon in the upper arm, which is this intrusion of aberrant synergies, which is this posture that you see on the left, uh, that is very common in people with stroke, but also other conditions in which the arm tends to automatically flex towards the, uh, their body uh, without actually wanting to, to flex it. And finally, spasticity will generally uh, create tone and rigidity in the joints of the arm and hand. So the combination of these uh, uh, four deficits to various degrees uh, severely impairs the quality of life. So that means that if we need to develop a technology that uh, um, addresses arm paralysis, we shouldn't just target strength, we need to address all of these problems, otherwise we won't have solved the issue. Um, so um, what I did um, was a study in monkeys um, with our collaborator in Switzerland, Stefanie Lacour, Grégoire Courtin and Jocelyn Block, where we actually designed an interface uh, um, that 
um, took inspiration from our work in the mo in uh, humans for locomotion, but um, that we tested first in monkeys, which are an animal uh, that is extremely similar to human in terms of organization of the upper limb movement. The idea of this technology was to target the same structure uh, that um, allows people to walk again after spinal cord injury. So we defined an electrode that had uh, contacts placed on the lateral aspect of the spinal cord to target these nerves that you see enter the cord, which are actually nerves that supply the muscles of the arm. So for example, the nerve C5 would supply uh, the shoulder muscle and the biceps and the nerve T1 would supply uh, the arm muscle. So if we could target independently these routes, uh, we would be able to convey ex artificial excitability to these muscles and replace what's lost from the brain. So the selectivity of this technology, it is very important for the arm to, 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 to address the different deficits uh, of the, the different uh, mm, sections of the of an arm. Uh, so, um, for example, uh, what uh, we obtain uh, in uh, in monkeys, in this video you will see the arm of a monkey in which we're stimulating a contact that really is producing shoulder movement. Then there's another contact that produces uh, uh, elbow uh, extension movements like you can see here very clearly, or even hand grasp. So we can really target the different sections of the arm and hand to re-promote movements uh, at the different uh, specific joints. And you can see here that by combining these contacts in smart ways, we can actually produce all our movements. You can see here very clear uh, extension of the arm, grasping and then pulling back. Uh, so what, why was this study extremely important? Because as I said, monkeys are extremely close to humans, not only in terms of um, anatomy of the arm and hand, but most importantly in terms of functional organization of the brain and the spinal cord. So when we saw this result, uh, we knew that uh, this could have worked in humans and we needed to put together uh, uh, um, a study that could test this. So uh, the University of Pittsburgh and the Department of Neurological Surgery were the perfect environment to, to test this because uh, of the tight access to, to the subjects uh, and patients that are treated at UPMC. And so uh, we designed a specific uh, a pioneering clinical trial in stroke with uh, some of the leaders in the field. So Doug Weber at CMU is a co-PI of the studies, uh, a world expert in neural engineering. Then there is Dr. Peter Gersten here at UPMC, who is our uh, neurosurgeon implanting all our subject. Dr. George Wittenberg, who's a neurologist at Pitt. Uh, Dr. Pirondini, who is uh, another PhD in the Department of PNR, expert in stroke and rehabilitation of stroke. Uh, Dr. Robert Freelander, the chair of neurosurgery here at Pitt. And finally, uh, Dr. John Krakauer, who is one of the leading world experts in stroke at John Hopkins. And we just received funding uh, for this study from the, uh, from the uh, NIH. Uh, so uh, what do we do in this trial? Essentially, uh, like I said, we uh, are applying this technology that we developed for the monkeys in humans by scaling it, of course, and, and using uh, more clinically approved uh, leads and, and electrodes to demonstrate uh, that uh, whether it's true that the delivery uh, of spinal cord stimulation to the specific area of the nervous system can improve strength, dexterity, and those aberrant synergies that we observe in people with arm and hand paralysis. So uh, our system uh, essentially uh, works uh, in this way. Uh, so we implant um, linear uh, electrodes that are clinically approved in the cervical spinal cord in the position that we found to be ex uh, effective in the monkeys. So we place two leads actually because the human spinal cord is very long and the clinically approved leads are actually short. So they don't cover the entire extent of the cervical spinal cord that we need. So we have to place uh, two leads. And the idea is that when a person tries to attempt to, to, to um, attempt a movement, uh, we will deliver spinal cord stimulation to the cervical spinal cord, which will support the, rem the residual intention of the person to move, and the subject will be able to move the arm as intended. 
So these leads are implanted for 30 days in the subject, and then they are connected externally to an external simulator that can allow us to deliver the specific simulation protocols that we need uh, for this patient, because today uh, there doesn't exist a stimulator that can actually deliver our therapy, but we're working uh, on that too. So here on the right, you can see the X-rays that we took from our first two subjects that are anonymized for obvious uh, reasons, uh, and uh, the positions of the leads that is on the lateral aspect of the cervical spinal cord. One is more caudal and one is, is more rostral. So uh, this is the MRIs of the first two subjects. The first subject uh, um, was uh, had a very specific lesion in the internal capsule that caused an interruption of the corticospinal tract, which is this tract that connects to the spinal cord. You can see here uh, using a, 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 a high definition tractography, which is another technique that we developed here at the Department of Neurological Surgery, uh, where we estimate the number of axons present that connect the motor cortex to the spinal cord. You can see in comparison of the left and the right that this subject has much less corticospinal axon to be able to control her left arm. And uh, in the case of the subject number two, the stroke, the lesion was actually quite massive. So this damage was even more prominent. So the two subjects have a very different impairment. One has a moderate paralysis, uh, which impairs her in any of her daily life activities, almost uh, uh, complete paralysis of the hand. And the second subject has a total flaccid paralysis of the arm and hand. So uh, the muscles of the arm and the hand in humans are organized in a very, very similar way to what we did with the monkey. So we knew that by placing electrodes near the uh, C4 and C5 uh, uh, nerve root, we would have stimulated the shoulder and then progressively down to the arm and to the hand. So you can see here, for example, in both subjects, regardless of the reason, that we can obtain selective activation of the shoulder or of the tricep muscle or of the forearm muscle that control the, the hand. Uh, so this is very reproducible. It depends on a precise location of the um, electrodes that is performed during uh, neuro neurosurgical procedure where we place this electrode with our neurosurgeon and our neuromonitoring team in the most precise possible way to be able to address and, and, and approach all the muscles that are required to perform all arm and hand movements. Um, and we can cover them uh, pretty uh, robustly in, uh, in all the subjects. So uh, what happens when we deliver stimulation? So what we do normally is that one of the first thing um, like uh, we were discussing before was showing whether we can improve strength immediately. So we place our subject into a specific device that we have here in the lab uh, that allows us to measure with a high precision the forces that are produced by the muscle. So in this specific location, for example, the subject is going to try to uh, push their arm up or down and then we would be able to record this force um, in this device. So, for example, on the right here, you see the trace of the force produced without stimulation in black and with stimulation in blue. You can appreciate that both subjects had a substantial increase in force, uh, uh, up to twice as, as stronger forces produced at the arm. For reference, uh, uh, this force is almost close to normal level of forces in a, in a normal people. And more strikingly, you can actually see the huge difference in activation of, of the muscle. So if we record activity in the muscle, you can see here in blue, uh, compared to the black trace, the, the, the substantial higher activation uh, of the muscle, uh, sorry, um, uh, that led to these improvements. And more importantly, beside the arm, uh, um, we actually uh, uh, could increase also almost twice as much the, the strength at the hand, uh, something that was uh, particularly important for SCS2, which, which basically couldn't produce any force uh, with her fingers, and now she's actually able to produce uh, detectable uh, strength and forces uh, with her finger. So to visually show you what's happening, we can see, for example, uh, SCS01 in her attempt to open her hand without the stimulation. Uh, these are the uh, devices that we use to record the EMG signals. You can see that this is the maximum that she can do without stimulation. She can't open the hand, she can't close it. That's the maximum range of motion for those uh, uh, fingers. But when the stimulation is active, really, 
five seconds after she's capable of uh, fully opening her hand. And actually here I also ask her to close the hand because I wanted to show you it's not just about opening. She has control over, over what she wants to open or close the hand. So she regained control over fingers uh, immediately just by turning the stimulation on. This is the so-called uh, immediate effect that I was discussing before. Similarly, when we target shorter muscle, normally uh, she can bring her arm up, but she can't do it more than this. And uh, uh, instead, when the stimulation is there, she has so much strength that she can just pull her arm all the way up to the head with absolutely uh, no fatigue or effort to do that. So this really substantially facilitates uh, her strength and movement. So we were really happy when we saw this because we thought, oh, we solved strength, so this is amazing, people can move. Uh, but actually our friend and mentor John Krakauer told us, well, Marco, this is not true because if it was true that uh, we would just need to improve strength, then I could just go to the gym and get strong and then start playing the piano like Mozart, which obviously is not the case. What does that mean? It means that we shouldn't only show that they can have stronger muscles, we need to show that they can move better. Um, so what we did was place the subject into a robot that was addressing exactly that. So it's measuring the kinematic with the, of the arms in a very uh, high degree of precision. And here you can see, for example, um, uh, the traces of uh, the kinematics movement of the arm on the plane where we ask the subject to reach towards three different targets. So she can't reach one of the targets because she has a um, she, in, in, impossible for her to extend the arm and, and when she can for example reach a, a target like that her trajectory instead of being linearly straight they are uh, very very uh, weird because she has to go around all the paralysis of their muscle in her arm when instead we activate the stimulation she has an immediately uh, an immediate capacity to smoothly and very quickly reach each of these targets with performances that are uh, almost indistinguishable with that of an intact person. This, by the way, is our amazing team of students uh, and collaborators that uh, are enabling these results. Uh, so basically here we're quantitatively showing that she's not just uh, getting stronger, she's actually able to control the movements better with the high accuracy, high precision. And um, um, because we live in the city of Andy Warhol, which is Pittsburgh, like you might know, uh, we really had to uh, have the subject try uh, to grasp a Campbell tomato soup, but it's not only because of honoring Andy Warhol is also uh, because actually grasping a soup can is an extremely difficult thing to do for a person with uh, uh, arm paralysis because if you think about it, it requires reaching the object while simultaneously rotating the wrist to get the hand in a cylindrical position. That sort of multi-joint coordination is what is lost and can only be recovered if we recover what we call dexterity. And so here in this video, uh, you can see our subject uh, trying to reach uh, a Campbell soup um, with her hand normally. So this is what she would do. You, you can see that she can move, her, move the sh her shoulder, but her elbow is, is paralyzed in this flex position and her hand is completely incapable of, uh, of uh, uh, supinating, uh, meaning rotating the wrist and grasping the gun. With the stimulation just after, she can easily, you can see, rotate the wrist and grasp the gun and elevate it. So this movement of uh, uh, reaching while rotating the wrist is, is, uh, is showing that she's really covering the capacity needed to produce multi-joint and complex movement that can actually help her in her quality of life, which we actually assessed in both subjects. This is an example, for example, of eating, because uh, you can imagine that, of course, having a paralysis has consequences on the way these people uh, can eat. So uh, without stimulation, uh, the subject can't actually uh, grasp uh, a fork and so uh, most importantly doesn't have the strength uh, to uh, take a nugget, a chicken nugget, so she has to uh, help herself uh, um, with the other hand to apply for. So, uh, which means that she will always use the other hand to it. And then, like we said, she, she can't bring this to her mouth because she can't really rotate her wrist to, to, to bring the, the nuggets to, to her mouth. Um, instead, um, with spinal cord stimulation, let me see here. Faster, yes. So she can reach the, she can reach to the fork. 
grasp the object in independence, and most importantly, uh, she can rotate the wrist and bring uh, the food to the mouth uh, in a way that is meaningful for her. So that means that the stimulation is meaningfully improving her uh, um, capacity uh, to have uh, a more fruitful life, an independent life. And so it's having an impact on their quality of life. So um, these that I showed you were uh, only immediate improvements. That means that they were immediately visible uh, in comparison of stimulation on stimulation off. But like I said at the beginning, what we observed in spinal cord injury was that when you would use this for a long period of time, they would start getting better and better. So we actually started measuring this, although our study was very short, just four weeks, but we started observing similar uh, outputs of the people that had uh, locomotion uh, paralysis for spinal cord injury. So these numbers here represent the Fugelmeyer impairment scale that goes from 0 to 66, where 66 is completely normal, and uh, they show how much the uh, three subjects that we did improved. So uh, this is the subject are ordered in uh, in uh, uh, severity scale. So this is the less severe, this is the moderately severe, and this is the most severe. So you can see that by the end of the four weeks, uh, all subjects had actually improved this course in a meaningful way, even if they were chronically uh, uh, had a stroke uh, uh, some uh, more than nine years ago. So this is already remarkable per se. But what is interesting is that subject one and three uh, could even get much better uh, with stimulation on. So when you perform this test with stimulation on, uh, actually subject one got to levels that are uh, meaning uh, almost almost uh, uh, normal motor performances. Uh, so one wonders what would happen if we were to extend this study higher than four weeks. In fact, the, study, the results that I showed you before in spinal cord injury were obtained after one year of training. And instead, us in just four weeks, uh, we could obtain these um, extremely relevant improvements in people with stroke. So the next step in our research is trying to understand why this is happening, what make, what causes it a better or a lower score, and uh, how long should we extend the study to really keep improving uh, uh, these people's uh, uh, lives. And most likely what we expect is that there will be a, progress a progressively better improvement depending on the lesion severity. But even somebody that has an almost paralyzed arm uh, can improve in just four weeks. So extending this more, we would expect this number to increase more and more following their severity. Uh, so um, how can make this happen? Of course, we have a lab and this is great because we can pioneer these things, but really um, uh, my team uh, decided to spin out a company because it's the only way that that technology can exit the lab and be approved by the FDA to become a therapy. So Mark Powell and Angelica Herrera are uh, leading both PhDs um, that uh, are alumni in, in our laboratories of the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, they will uh, bring this dream forward and try to make uh, this technology a therapy uh, approved very soon for everybody. So with that, I really wanted to thank you uh, to thank you for listening and thanks all um, my lab members, uh, including uh, uh, my wife here with also a PI at Pittsburgh and a very close collaborator uh, in this program um, of research. Uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Dr. Capagrove. So what an incredible presentation, truly. Um, we're going to begin the, with our Q&A portion of our presentation. Uh, we'll try to get answer as many questions as we can or a lot of time. Dr. Freelander, would you like to start us off? Sure. Thank you, Marco. Uh, it's, uh, again, fantastic uh, presentation. And even though I've seen these videos many, many times, I still don't believe them. Uh, you actually saw it, it in person, too. <laughs> and yeah. seen it in person, too. And it's, uh, and, you know, the, 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 the first... Uh, Patient obviously was a patient of mine that uh, that I've treated uh, uh, before, and uh, so this is a really really fantastic. You know, as a, a scientist myself, um, I do different kinds of uh, experiments. But you know, you always you do an experiment, you have a question, and you doubt what the result's going to be. You you're just not sure of what the result is, and in part that's why you do the experiment, and you learn a lot from doing the experiment. But a big part of it is really not knowing what the result is is uh, going to be and i i'll never forget that when i was discussing with uh with marco 
the first experiment uh, that he was uh, going to do in the stroke patients for upper extremity, um, I call it the uh, reanimation. Um, yeah, I, I, I wasn't sure what he was what what it was going to be. I mean, what he's doing is is a fairly uh, I don't want to call it crazy, but it's it, it, it it's amazing, and you know you never know exactly what it's and, and he was there was no doubt in his mind. It was a hundred percent. This is going to work, and this is going to work well, and it's going to do X, Y, or Z. And I remember when uh, we got the results, and he was uh, really uh, studying that that first patient. It was like Wow, and so I'm going to turn that question back to you, uh, Marco. How how are you so sure this was going to succeed? I think this is an extremely deep and important question. The reason why I was so sure is that we did experiments in the monkeys. So a lot of time we hear discussing about uh, animal research and the relevance of animal research for clinical translation. Uh, I think that uh, our results actually demonstrate the importance of animal research and in our because of what we do specifically on non-human primate research. Um, by doing experiments in three monkeys essentially, we could pioneer a technology that would be able to help uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people per year, we hope. Uh, so if you choose the right animal model, and in our case, this was the monkeys, um, when you see that this is working in that animal model, then you have uh, uh, pretty much uh, strong confidence that this will translate to humans. Um, there's a problem of reproducibility in science uh, in, uh, in terms of a lot of people that criticize the use of animals because they say that they, their results can't actually don't replicate in humans. But that is um, not entirely true. It is true only if you do not choose uh, the appropriate animal model for the things that, that you're studying. Uh, so in our case, we knew that the right model was monkey, and although that is an extremely difficult um, experimental model to work with, uh, we had to do it if we wanted to make uh, translational science. So as part of this, uh, we keep working in monkeys to be able to keep producing always new results that we can readily translate in the clinic. Uh, can, uh, can, can you discuss, uh, and you, you did to some extent, uh, discuss the uh, the work on neurodegenerative uh, diseases and really using spinal cord stimulation to augment uh, function in a therapeutic approach but um, do you want to expand further on that yes actually um Dr. Philander asked me, well, do you think that this could work also in neurodegenerative diseases? Because um, it's a very interesting uh, uh, application because these are orphan diseases such as SMA or ALS, which are neurodegenerative processes that kill the neurons in the spinal cord that control uh, the movement. Uh, so uh, Dr. Philander himself has done many years of research in this area. So I have approached uh, uh, these publications and uh, and, and modern publications in SMA uh, that actually show that um, um, these diseases progress by uh, reduce sensory inputs to the motor neurons. So as it happens, actually our technology is targeting exactly these structures that lead to the degeneration of the motor neurons. Uh, so that's how, uh, as you know, we had this idea of actually trying this technology in a neurodegenerative uh, uh, disease because by targeting the neural element that leads to the generation of the motor neurons, we could probably not only improve motor performances by this effect that we have seen in, in uh, stroke, but in this case, even possibly slowing down the degeneration process because we would remove one of the sources that causes uh, uh, malfunctioning of the motor neurons. So we're very excited to actually have started a clinical trial supported by Roche Genentech uh, here at the University of Pittsburgh to try this technology in people that have spinal muscle or atrophy. So soon, uh, maybe at the next Friday with Freelander, we'll have some results to share there as well in humans. Yeah, no, I'm very, very excited to that work. And now, uh, if you stand back for a second and think of all the work that's been done over decades, even centuries, but let's talk about decades, of the different components that were required for you to be successful now. One is obviously understanding neural circuitry, uh, understanding neurotransmission connections in, in, in general, also the technology, you know, the stimulators, the implants, uh, um, surgical experience uh, with, a, with a, these and so on. W what do you think is going to be the next 
big leap in information. What would help you to be able to achieve, you know, better and more protracted uh, effects uh, in terms of what can medicine and sciences provide yeah. to you? I think that you touch on a very important point on the technology. The technology right now is really limiting our uh, our resources because even for basic science, we can't access uh, uh, all um, the circuits in the spinal cord to study how to improve this. So we're trying to use the most advanced neurotechnologies uh, in animal models to understand better and better the circuits. But um, for what we understand today, uh, we are limited by current availability of medical technology. The medical technology that we are around was developed in the 80s. This is why I welcome actually uh, the uh, opening of the field to pioneers, uh, uh, for example, like Neuralink that is lead uh, is led by Elon Musk, because although um, the application that they develop do not seem readily applicable to, to therapy, actually the technology underlying that is extremely promising and could allow us to access modern ways to stimulate and interact with the nervous system at a much more detailed level that we can't do now because we're using essentially stimulators that were developed in the 80s. So if we could have even better technology, we could leverage more the science that, that we know and also discover new things. Because the reality is that when you start using new technologies and you use them in human and that you get new data, this new data will lead also new discoveries. Uh, so I think that um, that this is the main uh, uh, main innovation that could really improve our work today. Well, thank you. Well, I want to leave some time for uh, questions from the audience. Uh, Justin. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Friedlander. Um, Mark, I'm just going to start off with uh, a couple of uh, just comments from the audience. Uh, Dr. Capogrosso, uh, this is incredible research. We're very fortunate to have you in Pittsburgh. Uh, another comment here. Congratulations on your award. Your work will help so many. And another one, uh, a great up update about your research. You've had only a couple. You've had a couple of other times, and uh, as you said, maybe the next time we'll have even even more exciting news. So, um, just a, a, a incredible, um, incredible work, uh, Dr. Capogrosso. Um, the first comments, uh, or I'm sorry, question here from the audience: uh, Do you see your research translating into speech recovery from stroke? <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting uh, uh, question. Uh, so no, in the sense that, I mean, research in general, yes. Unfortunately, we can't um, stimulate the speech area from the spinal cord. So my research is really focused on the spinal cord. We'll not be able to address that. But I know that uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jorge Gonzalez Martinez in, this, in our department and Dr. Elvira Pirondini was one of the collaborators of the trial are actually working on a deep brain stimulation technology uh, for that uh, for that reason. So they're working on it right now. So it's really premature to say if it's going to work, but um, an approach that stimulate the brains is probably more suited to recover speech because the speech center are, are above uh, the levels that we can stimulate with the spinal cord. Excellent, thank you. Um, what do you see as the biggest roadblocks in taking your research to uh, clinical application? Yeah, um, so we discussed a little bit with Dr. Ferrander just a moment ago, the roadblocks for future developments, so long-term development. Right now, um, the, what what it's uh, very challenging to accept when you are a, a, a scientist is the fact that between the lab and the clinic, there's an enormous amount of uh, time and money required to actually bring something to, to the patients. <clears throat> um, that is because, um, first of all, even if we have a demonstration in five or six people that this is actually effective, we still need to uh, um, obtain the money to be able to run a very large clinical trial that would be accepted by the FDA, similar to what we have heard, um, uh, we kept hearing all these years about the vaccine. So we need hundreds of people treated with these uh, devices to show that they are effective and, and make appropriate controls against placebo before this can be actually approved by the FDA for use in human. Uh, so that takes an incredible amount of resources. And uh, I, I heard estimated essentially bringing a neurotechnology from the lab to the patient bed requires about $100 million. So this is not the 
amount of money that a laboratory can um, obtain. Uh, this is why uh, my teammate, uh, uh, some of my trainees uh, uh, left the University of Pittsburgh to initiate a startup because uh, when you go uh, on an industry level, uh, that's when you can attract capital from investors that can bring that in that sort of money to develop a therapy into into to develop a technology into a therapy. So um, that is the biggest roadblock. So uh, availability of resources to be able to do what's necessary for the FDA to approve a technology like that for use uh, uh, for using humans. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Capogor. So um, what advice uh, do you have for a recent graduate who wants a career like yours? Uh, do a PhD. <laughs> Absolutely, in our lab, if you want. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of path that can lead to to this research. Our teams, for example, are very multidisciplinary. I have a background in physics, for instance, and then I did a, a PhD in bioengineering. But we have MDs that are doing a PhD in our lab. We have biologists that are doing a PhD in our lab. There is many laboratories in the world. The University of Pittsburgh is actually one of the most important centers for the uh, development of neurotechnology. There's really a large community and a strong collaboration with UPMC to actually do human work, but there's also other centers around the world um, uh, that uh, that do this sort of technology. But really, um, when I he started my PhD, I didn't know what an axon was. I was an expert in electromagnetic fields, uh, which is why I started studying electrical stimulation. But um, I learned this during my PhD. So really, uh, you can come into this sort of research through multiple backgrounds and, and the more diverse the team is, uh, both from uh, the um, uh, scientific point of view and uh, uh, and, and um, let's say international, uh, ethnical, racial point of view, the better is because we really combine a lot of point of view and inputs uh, into 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 new ideas. That's great. We just I had two questions that I think maybe you answered for me uh, in in right there, uh, but you can see if you want to expand on them at all. One one of the questions was, what are the backgrounds of the people with whom you collaborate? And another one was, uh, what makes it special to to uh, practice your research at, at University of Pittsburgh? So I think you answered some of that in, in there, but if there's anything else you would like to add. Yeah, no, really any background uh, that is uh, that is related to STEM. In fact, I'd be even interested to work with people that have uh, more of like a philosophical background because uh, we we when you start touching the brain of people, there's also ethical questions that we uh, explore uh, both for the application of animal research, for example, how ethical it is to do animal research and what can we do, what we can't. So even collaboration with people that have a, a, a more literature based uh, ethical background uh, it's welcomed. That's great, thank you. Um, so we have uh, two more questions, and they're uh, they're actually the same as well. Uh, one asks, "Are you enjoying any Italian restaurants in Pittsburgh?" Pittsburgh, and the other is, "What is your favorite local Italian restaurant, Marco?" So, <laughs> local Italian restaurant is my house where I cook. <laughs> actually, you can ask Doctor Philander; he tried it. I think he can. Uh, he can tell you that it's true. Um, but um, otherwise, I mean, no. That's uh, there's a uh, there's a lot of places that are really cool. Uh, for example, Mercurio has a very good pizza. Pizza. Great suggestion. We're, we're uh, glad you're with us in Pittsburgh, Dr. Capagrosso. Uh, thank you again. Uh, what an incredible presentation. We look forward to having you back on and learning more. Um, thank you to all of our attendees. If you, again, if you have any questions or would like to learn ways about uh, supporting the work that you just uh, uh, saw Marco present, please reach out to me at jrm233 at pit.edu. So happy to stay connected with all of you this way. Dr. Freelander, would you like to close us out, please? Sure, thank you uh, very much. If I would have known, we would have uh, requested sponsorships from uh, Italian restaurants and uh, <laughs> find, find your research. But, right, uh, I can tell you Dr. Capogrosso's uh, lobster linguine is is, is amazing. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, but, uh, and he's a great bartender and, 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 and all of that. Um, uh, and his wife as well, uh, who's uh, obviously expecting a, a child uh, very soon. Uh, we're looking forward to celebrating.
Thanks. Uh, to, together with you. So again, really fantastic work. I can't wait to, to see all the exciting new work and uh, that uh, that you're developing. You're helping so many people and clearly it's a it's a research that's uh, there and it's being uh, developed and um, uh, you know it will be uh, fantastic and uh, again thank you very much uh, for joining our neurosurgical family and uh, you know we look forward to many many years of productive uh, collaboration our next uh, speaker in the series is dr jorge gonzalez uh, martinez so again a close collaborator of uh, dr capo grosso who will uh, again be talking about some of his uh, really amazing work in uh, epilepsy and uh, functional uh, work. So again, thank you all uh, for joining us. Have a great uh, weekend and we'll be seeing you in a couple of weeks. Take care.